Welcome to this episode of Doublers. I'm here with the lovely Lauren Yu, who is a fabulous bassoonist and an even more fabulous software engineer um, who's currently based in Washington, D.C. Welcome, Lauren. Thank you, Erin. Yeah, thanks so much for coming on. Um, so I gave away a little bit. I told you, I said what city you're in, but could you start us out with a little bit of an intro where you are um, and a little bit of background where you grew up, where you went to school, that kind of fun stuff to get people familiar? Sure. So um, I grew up in Buffalo, New York. Um, I went to school for music and, well, actually for music, music ed and math at Eastman and the University of Rochester. Uh, and then I, I continued on to Connecticut. For, um, I did my master's at Yale in bassoon performance, moved to New York for a couple of years, and then moved here three years ago uh, because my husband got a job with the uh, Airmen of Note. So that's what led me here to Washington, D.C. Sweet. That's awesome. Lauren and I met while she was in New York City, and we had many wonderful times together. And you used to live like a block and a half from me in Inwood. We were really, yeah. really close there. <laughs> I loved Great your building. Times. Yeah. It was. It was. Um, cool. So when you were in school, it sounds like you studied, you kind of had like a double track going on where you were studying music, performance, music education, and math. And what brought you to that? Yeah. So when I first went to college, I was picturing a career as a bassoonist in an orchestra. Um, I liked music ed purely because my, actually my mom had been a uh, instrumental music teacher. Mm -hmm. So I was just interested in doing more of that, I guess. And I also just did math for fun. I thought I, I really liked it in high school, and I took it to kind of complete um, some of my humanities credits transferred. So it was kind of nice that I didn't have to take kind of the, the random classes in order to complete my, my music degree. Cool. So can you share a little bit more about um, some of your recent gigs over the last couple of years that you've been, that you've been doing as a bassoonist? Yeah, so I guess the thing that I'm most excited about and love the most about playing bassoon is that I'm in uh, the Breaking Winds Bassoon Quartet, and we started doing that in while I was we were at Eastman. Um, just we started doing that for fun in our spare time, and then it grew into something that lasted. It's we've been together now, I think, uh, twelve years. Oh so, my gosh! Yeah, it's it's been a while, um, but I just find that first of all we're really good friends in addition to working well together. Um, and I find the music the most creative, fun, least pressure, you know, just like the best of all all worlds. And then aside from that, um, I played a lot in Florida with you uh, over the past two years, <laughs> specifically mostly with um, South Florida Symphony. Um, and most recently, right before COVID uh, happened, I started something with Southwest Florida Symphony also. So that nice. was nice. Uh, and aside from that, I have... I picked up a couple of local gigs around DC, but again, they said they were happening right before COVID came in. So, you know, as it goes. Yep. Yep. That's the year. That's what's going on. That's cool. So can you share a little bit more about the Breaking Winds and how that got started and, and what that's been like over the, the 12 years is a long time for a chamber group to be together. Yeah. What's really interesting is that it's grown very uh, naturally. So we started out, as I mentioned, just for fun. Um, as everybody that is has a music degree knows, there's something called juries uh, at the end of most years where you have to do a big performance test. And for some reason, in our sophomore year, they, they had us do it in the winter time to kind of space out, or maybe to not tire out all of our professors. Mm. So when everyone else was really stressed, we had off for maybe one or two weeks. And so we decided to put together a really fun performance. Um, where it was kind of interactive. We combined music with brunch, which of course all college kids love. So we had that and bubbles under their seats to kind of play along with some like wedding music. But <laughs> it was based off this really famous bassoon quartet called uh, the Bubonic Bassoon Quartet. And um, after that, we just continued playing because it was just really, really fun. Everything you thought it would be when you went to school for music. And yeah, when we went to uh, do our master's degrees, it was like a long distance relationship. So that was interesting, <laughs> having to figure out, you know, how to coordinate while we, we went to three different colleges. Um, yeah. And then we, yeah, we'd had, we started setting up these big tours so that we could play together um, and also have some quality time. And eventually we raised, the, one of the coolest things is that we raised money for a Kickstarter, uh, for a CD on Kickstarter. And somehow, I think one of the, someone that works for Kickstarter plays bassoon. 
Oh. So they they saw our thing and put it on the main page. So we raised twenty seven thousand dollars for our CD, which was that is amazing. Awesome. Yeah, especially because so many of the rights for the pop songs that we do cost a lot of money. So we used every penny to to um, either go into that or album art and things like that. Yeah. But yeah, and then since then we've continued to do you know a handful of big meetups every year. Um, we go to almost every um, IDRS conference, and we're sponsored by Fox Snow, Fox Fox Products. Um, and we also, a couple years ago, we went to some international tours, like China, and then the international um, IDRS, I think it was 2018, in Spain. So That yeah. is so cool. And for anyone who's not hip to bassoon world, IDRS is the International Double Reed Society. Um, how does anyone not know what that is? I, <laughs> it's, it's an incredible thing to think about, how anyone could possibly not know. But <laughs> just, <laughs> just to share. So what you're saying is that you're a bassoon celebrity. So are the student celebs. No. Student celeb status. <laughs> and some of the stuff that, I mean, I've watched a lot of the videos. I mean, my favorite video, I think, is the Lady Gaga one with the wigs. Thank it's you. Yeah, so we good. used to be, I feel like we used to be more gutsy with, or maybe perhaps we're more lazy now. But in the beginning, we would get dressed up. We had like two hour concerts with costume changes for every piece, and oh we'd be gosh. like jumping. Yeah. It's calmed down a little bit since then, now that we're old. <laughs> right? I know. Once you hit your 30s, your appetite for bouncing around on stage, I'm sure, diminishes. <laughs> yeah. That's so cool. And so and so, you're all based in different cities at this point, I think, right? Yeah. So right now we are in Houston, Seattle, New York, and D.C. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so that, that must be logistically... That's, that's a lot of logistics to keep the group, you know, to get the group together to rehearse, to get the, everybody together to perform and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, I think in the beginning, it, like I said, it took a little bit of, um, there was an adjustment period mm-hmm. where we figured out how to best communicate through, back then remote work was not as common. So, you know, having to communicate through email and everything um, and Google Docs and whatever, it, it was a little more complicated. Uh, but once we got the hang of it, what we try to do now is set up a, a tour, a week-long tour, so that we can um, kind of build in some like review time, practice mm-hmm. time before we have all of our performances. Yeah. And yeah, again, when air travel was safer, we would we would do it pretty regularly that we had a system down. Yeah, that's so cool. That's really yes, awesome. The good old days. <laughs> right, I know. Back in the days when you could get on a plane and it wasn't a big to do. <laughs> <laughs> or at least, yeah. Yeah, that's that's really awesome. And um, so once life goes back to a little bit more normal, it sounds like the plan is to continue that trajectory with the group and to be to be touring and doing things like that. Yes, we hope so. Yeah. And actually, we've been working on our second album for a long time. And it's, it's just been going through the final stages of um, editing and getting ready to actually send to uh, maybe disc makers or some. That's what right. we used last time. But something yeah. like that to actually produce the CD. Cool. Or who knows, maybe we'll just, actually, I didn't think about that. We might not produce physical CDs now that we're getting to this. It's a little different than a few years ago. Right? I know. We, when Calliope did our album, we did physical CDs and we we're all kind of laughing because I was like, I don't, I don't even have a way to play a CD <laughs> that belongs to me. I mean, Alex has a super drive somewhere, but like, yeah, it's funny how you end up like, you're like, wait a second. But, um, but yeah, that, that's. That's very cool. That's really exciting that that project has kept going at such a pace um, and you've been able to keep up with that. Because, I mean, it's hard. Listen, I understand. It's very hard to communicate. And we all, my quintet, everybody lives in the same metro area. I mean, Brooklyn's basically a different country than where I am. But, you know, it's uh, it can be challenging um, to do all that stuff remotely and, and to figure out how to collaborate. Um, so it's kind of a nice segue into the other side of, of what you're up to, um, working remotely. So what, what, um, what is your other career pursuit outside of music and, and how did you, how did you find yourself there? Yeah. So, um, I'm a software engineer now. Um, while I was living in New York, I started to do math lessons part-time as a tutor. I started working as a tutor and I really enjoyed that, but 
it's just like freelancing with music. It's freelance work where, you know, if you're sick or something happens and something gets canceled, you don't get paid. So it's, it's not always reliable Mm -hmm. and that can be really frustrating, especially if you're a hard worker. Um, so I, it took me a really long time to figure out what I wanted to do. I, I knew I wanted some kind of job that was flexible enough to allow me to still perform. Mm -hmm. Uh, but also I wanted to really like the job. So something that I found engaging and and eventually I realized, I think coding is actually a really great marriage between creativity and, um, like problem solving. So yeah, I took, I was, it was intimidating to be honest, you know, to jump into a whole new field. And also I didn't know if after 10 years I would learn the same way. I hadn't been to classes in a decade. So, right. But I, I was happily surprised that it, it, it didn't feel as awkward as I, I actually really loved it. Um, and my brain still worked. And it's a miracle. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and my brain still worked. And I went to my boot camp and it was great. Yeah. And it, the timing is kind of amazing when I look back at it. So I, I started my boot camp on January 27th of 2019. And I, got, I started my job exactly six months later on July 27th. Um, yeah, so it, that's pretty cool. Was that this year or last year? Oh, 2020. Yeah, I meant okay. 20, that's 2020. what I thought. I started July 27th of 2020. And I, sorry, January 27th of 2020. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah. July, yeah. Yep. And July so you were... So for folks who may not be familiar with the concept, um, so a, a software coding boot camp is a, is a short program shorter than say getting a four year computer science degree that's designed to give you specific software engineering skills in a short period of time, hence the boot camp, and then prep you to, to be ready for work after that. Um, and so it's, so you started the boot camp before any of the COVID stuff happened before any of the quarantine. And so when you started boot camp, were you going in person or was it already remote? Yes. So I started in person. I specifically wanted in person because I thought it would be a better learning experience, which if you have the choice, I would recommend uh, because we split uh, about halfway through is when we went to remote work. Mm -hmm. Um, That's when I think that was the middle of March and that's when um, that happened. So, you know, it's still possible, but I did. And it was much easier to just pop over, you know, look over your shoulder and ask someone to check, check a piece of code. Right. Right. To have that sort of in person mixing um yeah. that we're all really coming to appreciate i think at this point um, and so so then when you were hired into your into your current job were you hired directly out of boot camp and then you just went straight to your job or were there some interim pieces in there so the way that uh, i went to flat iron school mm-hmm. that's the boot camp i did and the way that they work is um you basically have a certain amount of time to declare your job search. So once that once you do that, that means you have to to fulfill a certain set amount of uh, requirements each week. Because if you don't find a job within, I believe it's 180 days, then they'll give you back your money for the boot camp. But oh, wow. you have to show that you're actively searching so that you right. know, it's not like you you drop off and then you get your money back. Right. Um. So basically, what I did is I finished at the beginning of May, and I took three to four weeks to solidify everything. I, I built a personal website, my resume, my cover letter, uh, template. I, I wanted to make it really, really um, easy and set up for when I went to job searching because I heard that it's very typical to apply to hundreds of jobs. Hmm. So yeah, I did that. And then starting in June is when I started sending out applications. And then this was actually the very first place I interviewed at. Um, oh, wow. The first one. Yeah, that was really cool. So that, the first place um, that they were the first ones to contact me, and then it ended up working out. That's so cool. Yeah. And so, were you hired directly as a software engineer, or did you have um, like an internship position or something at first? Yeah. So the way that m- my company works is everybody is hired, or at least for the data scientists and engineers, um, all the the regular level people are hired first as interns as like a trial period. Mm. But then within two or three months, you're usually offered a full-time job. So oh, okay. that happened for me as well. I think I was at about two and a half months when I got, when I was offered my full-time job. Cool. So it's like a trial year with an orchestra. You just have to, yeah. <laughs> you have to show up, do what you're supposed to do. And then someone will offer. That's very cool. And so, um, 
so it sounds like the boot camp itself was about three or four months. Is that right? Yeah, it was 15 weeks. Oh, okay. Split into um, five, what they call mods. Mm -hmm. So three little divisions of time where with each of those mods had a final project, but the last one had like a, a giant project that you did all by yourself. Oh, wow. Cool. Yeah, that's that's cool. awesome. Um, and so, and that's a full-time thing, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Like they do offer part-time, but that would be online mm -hmm. even in non-COVID times all online. Yeah. 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 Cool. Cool. And so, and in your job now, I'm sure you're working remotely. Yes. So my company before COVID, pre-COVID was all in person. Mm -hmm. uh, interestingly though, they have been, they are now more open to remote work even after COVID ends. So I think they've seen that it can be really successful since the whole company is currently remote. Yeah. And then I think um, once this all ends, there's, there's going to be some kind of hybrid thing because some of the people that they hired during COVID don't even live in DC. Oh, so wow. they will ab definitely have to be remote. <laughs> right, right. They're like, surprise, we can come back to the office, so you have to move now. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's very cool. Um, and so when, when everything sort of comes back online, if you will, um, it sounds like that might be helpful for, for balancing what, what your music life is doing and then, and then keeping on with your, with your job. Yeah, so one of the things I was hoping for was a job that um, did allow like for some remote work because mm -hmm. I figured if I did go on a tour, I could still technically work uh, during work hours sometimes, but then just have a concert at night or mm -hmm. um, rehearse around that. So in my bassoon quartet, there's three of us that have regular jobs, and we usually do something like that where we're working during our tours, um, and then we, we build in rehearsals around that. That's very cool. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, and so yeah, it sounds like the it sounds like the interest in math kind of brought you into that direction of deciding that coding boot camp was the right was the right place for you to go next and and feeding into that decision. Yeah, well, it was a bit of a leap of faith mm -hmm. uh, because I think until you try coding, it's kind of hard to understand what it is, or it was for me anyway. It yeah. seemed kind of magical. Um, and it then once magical. you're, yeah, <laughs> but once you actually dig into it, it's so interesting how these little simple, you know, if this, then this, how many times, um, how that builds everything. There's the building blocks of all the websites you've ever seen. Uh, but it also, and my dad's also a software engineer. So he, he told me he thought I'd be good at it. And I finally listened. Um, don't you hate when dad's right? I know. <laughs> Yeah, but to be honest, the one other reason I was interested in it is I'm kind of terrified of tech. Uh, I'm scared, you know, that someday they're going to take over somehow, and I I like to be more comfortable. You know, make your make your enemies keep your friends close and your, enemies, your enemies closer. Closer, yeah. That's how, <laughs> that's my feeling with tech as well. That's a good way to look at it because it's true. The robots are coming, so you might as well know how to program them when they when they show up. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm with you on that. I am with you on that. Um, and so I know that it's a little bit of a, this is sort of like a new thing and, and the world has been upside down for a while, but how have you previously balanced gigs and being a freelancer and, and doing things with your, with your quartet with outside other jobs? What's, what does that balance look like for you? Um, I think it's just been a little bit of planning so, you know, I, there, I think I did two gigs before COVID happened. And for that, they just, they did happen to work out with the time frame. I took one or two days off from my boot camp in order to do them. Yeah. But um, I think with enough planning and as long as you go to work at a company that's a little flexible, then it's totally fine. I, of course, I have less, um, it's harder for me to take every gig. But the good thing is I don't have to take every gig because the flip side. Since right. I don't need it all in order to support myself. So I can choose the important gigs and then the ones that I would normally not love doing anyway, I can skip. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of power in that to be able to say, mm, no thanks. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. When you decided to go to boot camp, did you have, because um, I know a lot of folks that I've talked to, I know I, I experienced this myself. Did you experience any sort of identity crisis in committing to that? Uh, you mean in terms of mu music? Yeah, like I know for myself when I decided like I'm moving into tech, I'm going to get a full-time tech job, I struggled with 
my identity no long feeling like my identity was no longer a musician and that I was going to be doing this other thing and that I was like losing a piece of yeah it, did that come up for you at all to be honest I I think that I was kind of going through a transition period for several years mm. and starting when I was in New York I was unhappy but I didn't know what to do about it exactly because I didn't really see a path forward and I think most musicians are also are pretty driven and I am too. And I, I wanted a specific path, not to just randomly choose some job, you know. Um, so I wanted to make sure it was the right thing. But then again, I think it's hard to know 100% that something's right. You know, you have to do, you do have to take a leap of faith. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I think you're right. A lot of times, especially when you go to school, like in music schools, people think if you don't end up as an orchestral musician, you failed or, you know, some kind of you didn't work hard enough or you didn't want some audition hard enough and um I, I don't think that's the case anymore and it was some amount of just being okay with that mm -hmm. with myself and then I felt totally free so at the once I made the decision to go to the boot camp no I, I had no I didn't feel that way anymore but I think it was coming around to understanding that that's okay that was the part that was the hardest is it's like, I'm still a musician, but I'm also a software engineer. Yeah. And you can have the and in your, in your job title. You can say, I yeah. am this and that. Yeah. That's, that's great. Um, I will say, um, I think I got my job because I'm a bassoonist. So really? Yeah. I heard after the fact that there were hundreds of applications, but I know the person that's first interviewed me liked me because she had also been a musician. So, and then I went, I did another collab lab I did a, a separate project where I was working with some mentors and a lot of them were also musicians or at least a couple so yeah 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 that's there's awesome. a network out there there really is um yeah collab lab is is run by some folks from my company from Zapier and um and yeah it's it's funny how as you get to meet I feel like it's more so in tech than anything you you start to meet people and you I was just talking to someone at my company today and you know, as uh, we do these things called donut chats where you're randomly paired with someone from across the company. We do that too. Oh, do you really? Yeah. They're so much fun. You just get a random friend for half an hour. Um, so I had a chat with, with someone at my company today and we were just talking and I mentioned that I was a musician and, oh, I played the viola. I loved being an orchestra. I had a great time. And, you know, you come across all these people who were either involved in music in middle and high school or they did it through college or even if they didn't take it in a professional direction it was a big piece of of their time growing up and so yeah it's interesting how you come across a lot of people who are you know either very serious semi-pro professional musicians or amateurs that had a great time you know yeah it seems like there's a lot of overlap yeah i think so yeah you know i heard over and over again that musicians are great workers but i i really believe it now especially since i've witnessed it with other people too um i think we just have so much drive and perfectionism in us <laughs> yeah that that we're yeah we're really good workers yeah it's kind of amazing because you go into a company and i don't know i'm it sounds like maybe you've had the same experience and you're like i'm just doing all the things that i'm asked that are asked of me and everyone's really excited <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm ticking all the box. Well, of course I would be ticking all the boxes. What am I supposed to be doing? Yeah. You gave me this checklist, this analysis. I'm doing it. So. Right. Right. And you're like, check, check, check. And then you yep. get, yeah, it's, it's amazing. It's fun. Um, and yeah. And the nice thing about doing that in tech is that there, there's compensation that goes along with it as yeah. opposed to music where it's just the bare minimum of even, even being in the room. So do you have any advice for musicians who might be considering? Because I know that this is a popular path to consider software coding boot camp. I mean, I know for myself, when I was looking to move into tech, um, it was a very tempting offer to, to do. Do you have any advice for people who are considering that path? Yeah. Um, so before I went to my boot camp, I did try a few of the free courses. There's so many resources out there. That's one of the really, the most amazing things about the tech world. Also that I, I feel like they're very generous, but you know, everyone shares their, well, not everyone, but there's so many open source things where they share their code and multiple contributors that I feel like at the moment, at least they're all doing it just to, um, it for progress to mm -hmm. try to help each other to build things. So yeah. 
um, that's kind of cool to see that. And uh, so, so I tried a few courses. And the thing is, though, I I knew I liked the little things that I learned, but I did not know how they connected. I had, and it, it turns out I had been learning. I think I took some a course. I tried, I took the course you recommended from. It was like a Harvard CS fifty. Oh yeah, um, CS fifty. Yeah, I didn't finish it. That was actually great though because it gave some great overview. Yeah. And then I learned. A l- I took a little bit of a, like a JavaScript course and something else, but um, I, I just had no idea how they worked together. So at least once I knew I liked the building blocks, that's when I decided to do the boot camp. Mm-hmm. And again, this is where the leap of faith comes in. It's like I, I think I like it, but that's where the one thing I really loved about that, or you know, if you have a mentor, it's the same thing. Is when you when you learn. A specific path then you get to see how they all fit together so for us right. it was learning some of the the basics of writing in ruby first and then building a back end and then learning javascript and learning a front end and learning um like react which is a front end framework and then piecing them all together to build some huge app so that understanding that was great and and one other thing is that i um you will always not know something. And they, yeah. in fact, teach you to Google everything. Yeah. So it's just you have to become okay with feeling stupid all the time, but also then learning new things all the time, and it feels really good. Yeah. Yeah, that – it, and I'm sure – I mean, from my experience, I, this may have happened to you too, feeling, feeling imposter syndrome, but also – having to really learn and understand that like feeling like you don't know what the heck is going on means that you're really doing it because that's what everyone else is experiencing. And I think in music we're, we're taught to hide if we don't know something because it's a little bit more shameful (laughs) where it's like, how do you not know that? Um, whereas in tech coming out and just being like, I don't know, let's Google it is totally nor, you know, it's completely accepted. And that makes, makes you one of the one of the cool kids because that's what everybody's doing yeah you know i mean i still i love the music world obviously Mm -hmm. i think some i feel like some people might switch and then have a chip on their shoulder and on what the music world did to them but Mm -hmm. i i don't feel that way but i will say that i've noticed some unhealthy habits in the music world including the fact that people i think are very judgy um you know it's very common to be in an, an orchestral thing and not only to make a mistake and feel bad about it but to wonder how many other people are judging you for your mistake and holding on to that for so long Mm -hmm. um and i think as you said so when you go into the tech world and you have questions you're worried you'll be judged but in fact there's so many people there that want to help so yeah that's that's pretty cool yeah and, and i've been complimented on the questions that i've asked that i've been like Oh God, I can't believe I have to actually ask someone this, but people will say like, oh, that's a great question. And you're like, are you you sure? (laughs) Okay. But yeah, I think you're totally right about that, that there is a little bit of a, um, a little bit of a judginess that, that can come with it and, and learning to shake that off can be its own liberating and wonderful feeling as you're moving Mm -hmm. into a totally different field. Yeah. Um, yeah, and so so it sounds like you started off with some free resources and then just kind of dipped your toes in a little bit to see if you liked it and then took the leap of faith. So for any folks that are considering considering a move into tech in general, do you have any other thoughts or any other advice that you would share with them? Yeah, um, well, first of all, there's a lot of resources out there, as I mentioned. So I would try a few of the free resources. and. The thing is that in the beginning, you'll learn something that seems very simple, like, oh, this is a string. Uh, uh, you know, this means that it's kind of like like words would mm-hmm. be considered a string, whereas, you know, different integers may be, cons- I mean, numbers might be considered integers or floats, or it depends on the language that you're in, but you might learn like data types first and how to manipulate them. Um, so try that a little bit. If, if you find it interesting, then I would start looking into either some kind of structured course, either a boot camp or some kind of mentorship or a free course online that is very structured because I think that will really help you. You need to devote a lot of time. Yeah. Um, coding is like a foreign language and in order to do it, you need to live it. So I, for me doing a little bit here, there was not enough. I need. That's why I think I made the decision to just 
jump in because I wanted uh, I wanted it to pay off in the end to actually to, for it to be impactful. Mm-hmm. So I decided to do Flatiron because I had heard someone else that, of someone else's success story from a, like a friend. Um, but I would say that there's many amazing boot camps out there and you can look at their job placement rates, which is really important. Um, but also just I would double check that you actually like the way that their course is set up or their sometimes you know you can do like a test run and mm-hmm. see some of their pre-work. And I think from that you can you can tell how it's going to go. Yeah, yeah. And so at the end of the boot camp, it sounds like you had a lot. So even though you were you were fortunate to get the first gig that you interviewed for, um, it sounds like they have a lot of resources for the actual job search itself and helping people find their way into a into a position. Yeah. So I will say for for some reason I was expecting there to be a little bit more of a connection. Not exactly you know, a direct lead, but I thought that there might be a f- more companies that were like closely affiliated with Flatiron, mm-hmm. which there didn't really seem to be unless you were willing to move somewhere. Mm. Um, but they do have career services. So you meet with a career coach once a week and they really, that helped me a lot to, to cons- there were, he just had a lot of great uh, suggestions for my resume mm. and how something might appear to someone that's not even tech savvy. So that was really cool. And, oh, this is one thing that I will add. This is not going back to your other question. Is I think that there is a little bit of a misconception that when people say anyone can do tech, it's true. You don't need a math background at all. I mean, really, anyone can do it. But that doesn't mean it will be easy. I was <laughs> there were there were many times that you really have to engage your brain. It's not something that you can go on autopilot. So. If it feels hard, that's totally normal. Mm -hmm. But I think people have to be prepared to put in the work to be successful. And it's not just going to be that you're not handed some knowledge at the end that you can do a job well. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of like it's kind of like playing an instrument in that way where you just have to the it just takes that level of time because it's a craft in that same way. And so Mm -hmm. you really have to invest in it the way that you do to practice your instrument and get good at that. Yeah. Interestingly, similar to music, that um, there's so many ways that you can do things that are right. You know, Mm -hmm. there's there's different interpretations and ways that you can write code that's, oh my gosh, that sounds so dorky, but it's very beautiful. (laughs) You can, it's eloquent. You can see some code and you're like, wow, that's so short and it does so much work. It's so powerful. Right? (laughs) And it takes so much longer to write than a long, drawn-out thing. (laughs) It's hard to write concise code. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That's that's great. Um, Yeah, I mean, this has been really great information, especially for folks who might be considering considering that move. So thank you so much for coming on and chatting. uh, Of course. Yeah, and if anyone has um, any questions for Lauren, is there a good place to reach out to you? Uh, yeah, sure. You can reach out to me on LinkedIn. Probably that's the best place. Um, yep, Lauren Yu, so- software engineer, bassoonist. And yeah, I'll try to get back to you as soon as possible. I have actually had a few musicians reach out to me during COVID that are also going to boot camps. So that's really cool. There's, yeah. There's a bunch of us out there. Oh, yeah. It's definitely, it's definitely a more and more common story. Well, thanks again for coming on. Thanks, Aaron.
Yeah, and so do you have any other thoughts for um, for someone who maybe doesn't have a math background and is interested and and maybe wants to still... Um, God, what am I trying to ask? My brain is shorting out today. I am so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's totally fine. There's a train that passed by anyway. Oh, background. perfect. Perfect timing. <laughs> the train of thought that left my brain and it went by your building. <laughs> um,